So your drums sound like. Well, today I'm gonna explain to you why that is and how to fix that and how to get some banging drums every single time. In this video, we're gonna cover every single thing you're ever gonna need to know about drums. Sample selection, groove processing, spatial effects, panning, volume leveling, EQing, parallel processing, group processing. And at the end of this video, you're gonna have a firm understanding of how to produce banging drums. Before we hop in, I wanna mention that this drum course is part of a complete and comprehensive 30 day music production course that I just dropped. It is fire, it took me a year to make. It's over 17 hours of content. For my subscribers, it's half off, so it's under 50 bucks for you guys. So if that's something you're interested in, the link's in the description. Let's get into the video. So drums is one of the things that I see newer producers struggle with the most. I struggled with it for a long time. Your drums being such a huge part of your track and playing such a big role in your track as far as the vibe, the groove, the speed, having your drums sound good and high quality really can make or break your track. So we're gonna go over everything about drums and how to get that high quality sound we're looking for. So here's an example of two different drum loops. And the crazy part is that on paper, they're actually the same drum loop. So that means like they have the same kind of drums in the same spot. Let's kind of look at the difference here. versus huge, huge difference. And I mean, it might even be indistinguishable from the first drum loop, but it actually is the same drum pattern. And then we have a house example too. So this is like a house drum loop. So like literally night and day, like it doesn't even sound like the same drum loop at all. For a long time, I was this guy up here. I was the MIDI drum, Ableton stock drum guy, and I could not figure out why I couldn't get my drums to sound good. And it really breaks down to like five or six basic principles. And we're gonna kind of look over those, but first let's take a look at what a drum actually is. So anytime we're talking about a drum, a kick, a snare, a, a perk, a hi-hat, any of that, we're looking at a transient, a body, and a tail. And that's kind of important information to retain because that information has a lot to do with the samples we're picking and how we're using them. So the transient's basically like the hit, the body is how long it plays for, and then the tail is how long it takes to dissipate. So what makes drums quote unquote good? I basically broke it down to five different sections we're gonna look at. So the first one being sample selection. So the most important part about having good and effective drum loops is we need to choose the right samples from the beginning. So this is actually applicable across the board in music production. If you're not working with the right bass, the right sample, then you're never really gonna get to where you're trying to go. We can come over here and we could process these to high hell, but at the end of the day, they're just still not the right drums we're looking for. So the number one important thing I would say is sample selection. And that doesn't necessarily mean get a sample that's completely processed, although it could. That really means that we want the correct drums for our genre. So if we're working in house, we want house drums. If, we want, if we're working in trap, we want trap drums. If I use these drums over here, this drum kit for our trap loop, it wouldn't sound good. They have different characteristics. They have different, as we looked at, transients and bodies and tails and all that. So sample selection being number one. And that will basically entail us looking for third-party samples outside of Ableton because Ableton, so there's some that are decent. There's some that are, are kind of like timeless and they have everywhere, like the 909 and the 808 drums. But like none of them are really what we're looking at for this day and age in music production. So sample selection, go source some good sample packs. Look at what the artists and producers you like are using and use samples either they've made or samples that they're using in their tutorials or go on Splice and, and search for a genre. And you're already off to a good start. The next seems very simple, but it's very important. And that's proper volume levels. And one of the, the biggest things I see my newer students struggle with is having everything at zero or everything the same volume level. And based on what we've learned with stereo imaging and gain staging, we've pretty much already kind of touched on all this, but we don't want them the same volume level. We want them proportionate to each other and where they should sit on the spectrum and, and gain wise, volume wise. So volume levels will do wonders. It's so simple, but it'll do wonders for your drum loop. And then groove. So groove is a topic in and of itself. It's really what's gonna make or break your, your drums after the volume level and the sample selection. So groove can be described as length, pitch, velocity, placement, 
stereo image and movement. And then there's variation. So the same drum loop over and over again, any kind of genre, if it's house, if it's techno, if it's bass, it's, if it's rhythm, whatever, we want variation in there. And we don't want like a distracting amount of variation. We don't want the same thing every single bar. And that's gonna contribute a lot to having productive drums. And then good processing. So we don't always need to process drums. Sometimes it'll make our drums worse, but we wanna have good group processing and good overall processing practices based on what we've already learned. We'll go into how those apply to drums particularly in a second here. So sample selection, the foundation of having effective and good sounding drums starts with your samples you select. If you are working with the wrong drums, no matter how much you process them, they will never truly be good. So this is something that we just touched on that I find very true is we got one to start out with a good Good bass, a good template. Drums for your genre, professional samples used by or created by artists you aspire to sound like. Drums from sample pack or artists in one project or that have similar characteristics. So if I'm using drums from say decap drums, I'm more than likely going to stick to all decap drums or specifically the decap drums from that specific sample pack. So it's always good to use stuff that's similar because if, if they come from the same artist or they come from the same sample pack, odds are they have a lot of the same characteristics and we want our drums to be cohesive with each other. So that's a great way to start. And then transient consistency. So circling back to what we're looking at over here, the transient, the body and the tail, we want to maintain that consistency along all of our drums. So for instance, if we use like a big dubstep snare that's just huge and it has a huge body and then we use like a thin house kick or something like that, that's not going to sound good and have transient consistency across the board on your track. So proper volume levels, we've covered this in gain staging a little bit, but your kick should be your loudest element. And then your snare should be second or close. So some people will say, have your kick and snare at zero. It depends on how you're gain staging your project. Regardless of the decibel level, you want them close to volume. You want your snare a little bit turned down a little bit more because of the pink noise curve. And then we want our top end elements about 4 dB lower than our kick and our snare. And that's pretty much how I have this laid out here is we have kick and our snare, loudest elements, and then the top end elements are, are negative four estimates. So it depends on the drums, depends on the compression. We want them around 4 dB lower than the kick and the snare. So groove is everything, and I can't emphasize this enough. This is what makes your head move. This is what humanizes your drums. And groove can be described in about four or five different categories, and that's length, pitch, velocity, placement, stereo imaging, and movement. All those, implementing those on your drums is what's gonna introduce groove. So a good visual way of kind of looking at groove is we have a drummer here. And so when a drummer is playing the drums, every hit is a little bit different. When a drummer is playing, he's trying to stay close to on grid as he can, but there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of accents. So every time he comes down and hits the snare, he's hitting a little bit different. Every time he hits the hat, he's accenting them with velocity. He's accenting them with grid. So maybe sometimes he's playing them a little quicker. He's implementing ghost notes and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of groove in a nutshell. And in regards to a drummer, what a drummer is basically doing is he's trying to stay as far on grid as he can, where if we're exactly on grid with our drums, that's actually what's going to make it sound robotic and boring to us. So while a drummer might be trying to stay close to on grid, we want to manually put stuff off grid a little bit. So like notice over here on our project, we have this hat right here is delayed by 25 milliseconds. So it's a little bit later than everything else. And then over here on this ride, we have, let's take a look at these. So you can hear how this hat is, is hitting just a little bit after this ride right here. So that's the delay, that's the track delay. And then you'll notice this ride, we have three different kinds of hits here. We have like a, a hard hit. So hard hit would, would be talking about the velocity. So if, if our drummer, hit the ride hard, it would make more sound and it would have a higher transient over here. And then the next one is, is kind of a softer hit and then the next one's medium. So we're kind of having those accents that's going on here. And then pitch is also another good way to kind of introduce groove into your drums. I like to do a little bit of like pitch shifting with, with my hi-hats, especially like in, in trap hi-hats, changing the pitch a little bit because even on a drum set, it's not gonna be dramatically different, but the pitch is gonna vary a little bit. 
So that's one more thing we can kind of do to humanize our drums. Pitch drift is a good one. So there's one by Baby Audio, and we're not looking for like a huge increase in pitch. We're not looking for an octave or, or a semitone even, or even real, like we want to stay on like the sense. So the very finite amounts of pitching, and this will contribute to humanizing it and keeping everything moving. So again, it's almost unnoticeable. Thing we can do to keep stuff moving, changing slightly, and make it more humanized. Pitch can be one of those things. Then velocity. So velocity is, is what we kind of just looked out here where if this was MIDI, so some people like to work in MIDI. I much prefer working in audio, especially with drums, because we have a lot more control. So we can come over here and all our warping options, we can you know, increase or decrease the gain here for this particular hit. We can come in here and use beats mode to warp this so we can make the, the hit tr shorter or longer. So we can come in here and like make it a, a quick hit. And this is different than just cutting the clip. We're making the transient shorter. So we have all those options in audio. So that's kind of why I like to work in audio. But yeah, so velocity is, is, is a good one. That is just the volume of these hits. So we can come in here and move them down or uh, repitch. We can repitch them so this affects the pitch. Any kind of warping modes are great with drums. Repitch, beats, complex, just making those little changes and spending the time doing this kind of stuff. So the velocity and the volume level, how hard we're hitting and how long the transient is. And then the stereo image. So we've already learned for higher elements, we typically want them pan, not always, but it's good to kind of push them on the outside. And then keeping them moving with stereo imaging. So here's an example here. We have an auto pan on this ride. And it's, again, it's subtle. We don't want to overdo any of this stuff. And it's just slightly moving from the left to the right. So if you close your eyes, you can hear it kind of bouncing back and forth to the left to the right. But again, we didn't do it like this. Because now it's distracting. So that's, that's another kind of rule to abide by with any of this processing is we want it to work and sound natural, sound organic. But if we overdo any of it, it's going to be distracting. So we don't want to distract the listener with too much movement. We don't want to distract the listener with too much changes. We don't want to distract the listener with, with too much switch ups. Subtle and, and natural. That kind of brings me to variation. So we don't want to be this guy where it's same loop over and over again. There's no accent hits. Variation. So like here on this loop, we have a snare roll on the last bar. We have these little accent hits here that are playing. We have three of them kind of playing randomly. Then what up here, we have some little snare accent hits. And that all that is doing is it's just keeping this loop from getting boring and like hearing the same thing over and over again. And then if we were going on and we were producing the rest of this track, we would do a little bit more switch ups like that that are different. Again, not distracting, just adding little ear candy and little accents and whatnot. And then again, another example of the velocity is, is the kick up here. So think about if this is a drummer and he's using his foot pedal to hit the kick drum, he's going to hit it at different speeds and, and different velocities. So here's an example of like our first hit is, is a big, like a big velocity, a big kick. And then over here, we kind of have an accent one. And that little accent of the quieter one and then the louder one really kind of keeps everything moving and accents the right part of like what we're going into in this drum loop. And the other thing to listen to is they're all working with each other. There's kind of like a general flow of energy. A lot of the times I'll do like hi-hat rolls into my snare. They're just maintaining the same energy and like keeping everything pushing kind of in the same direction. So we have this kick and then we have that kind of hi-hat downward roll into the snare. So a way I like to think about my percussive elements is they really do kind of tie together our kick and our snare. They're like accenting the movement between our kick and our snare. So those are some variations of groove. And again, we can actually come down here and just toss Ableton grooves on stuff and implement groove this way. And so these have the little shuffles, they have the volume changes, they have the uh, off gridness and all that. We can find these that we like and one, ones that have the groove we're looking for save them and this is kind of like an easy shortcut for implementing groove on stuff so i really like any of the swing mpc ones and we can drag and drop this on midi or audio and it's going to implement all those shuffles and imperfections on everything so this is a great way to implement groove without having to go in here and like manually shuffle everything however you'll get to taste results if you do it yourself based on your in particular track. I can go on all day about groove because this is kind of where I live at. This is where I have my fun and this is where I like to spend my time is grooving my drums. 
But yeah, to kind of summarize, length, pitch, velocity, placement, stereo, imaging, panning stuff, and variation. This is all stuff that you're going to figure out how you want it to work by playing with this and experimenting over and over again. So next, we're going to touch a little bit on processing. So as far as processing goes, we want it light but proper for what we're trying to achieve and applying the principles of everything we have already learned about processing. Not everything needs processing. So at this point in the course, we've already gone over all the processing techniques, and now we're just going to kind of touch on how they might apply to drums particularly. Let's look at our, our techno loop now, see what kind of processing we did here. So we kept this one fairly straightforward. We have this shaker here, and we put a Haas effect and convolution reverb on it. And the reason for this is because in, in like a tech house or like this kind of loop, we have so much percussive elements keeping everything moving that we wanted to like put this one on the outside and push it back so there's room for all these different moving percussive elements. So nothing's different about this than we've talked about in processing, giving everything its own space. We have a little bit of panning action here. So we have these other top end elements. We're pushing to the left, pushing to the right. And then we have a little bit of glue compression. So this one's pretty simple. And again, the reason for that is because these drums were pretty solid. We had, you know, we got good samples and there wasn't any need to come in here and like saturate or kick or like EQ or snare. It was already pretty much good, good to go. Now, if you come over here and we look at the processing on our, our trap loop here, this one we did a little bit more work on. And as you can see, basic stuff like on our top end elements, we can really be aggressive with, with cutting out the lows on them because we really don't need the lows over here of our top end elements. And there's going to be so much other stuff going on down here that what I like to do is I like to cut until I hear a loss of character. So I cut, 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 cut. And then once I hear like, okay, this is kind of degrading and taking away from the sound, that's when I stop. So notice like on here, we cut way up here. We cut at like 1K and it's not really affecting the sound at all, like negatively. Now, if we come in here and we listen to the changes, like that little click on the top, don't really need it in this example. And we're going to have a lot of elements sitting there. However, if we push to this a little further, now we can hear right around here, it's starting to take away from some of the characteristics we want. See, now it sounds a little thin. So that's a good trick for EQing in general is go a little too far and then back off. And then we're like, we kind of find a happy medium of like, all right, we're move removing the stuff we don't want. At the same time, we are not taking away from the characteristics of why we chose that drum in the first place. And then on this, again, we have the auto pan. So keeping it moving, that's that's all it is, is panning to the left, panning to the right. It's not hitting in the same place all the time. R referring to this as a character on our soundstage, he's kind of running around a little bit, kind of giving us something to look out for and, and a little bit of ear candy. And then some reverb. So this one's got some pretty aggressive reverb on it. We're pushing it back. And then of course, gain staging it down by negative 10. So then we have this little snare here. A Little bit of delay, again, subtle, everything subtle. What, less than 5% on the dry weight of the delay. A little bit of ping pong, so it's bouncing back and forth. And again, just a little bit of movement, a little bit of keeping everything different. It's panned to the right a little bit. This snare is panned all the way to the right. We have kind of have like this accent shot that's way over on the right. And then this one's pitched down. Yeah, it's pitched down in beats mode. Little details like that instead of having this hit twice. So group processing is a big topic as far as drums goes. Basically, we have this drum loop and we want to glue everything together so it's all cohesive. And we have the opportunity to do that on our group of our drums. So that's why I always make a drums group. I typically do a kick and a snare group, a top end group, and then a, a group to group all of them together. So you can group within groups. So typically what I do on my kick and in my snare group is I will add some saturation because again, we want to bring our kick and our snare to the very front. So a little bit of saturation, some parallel compression. It all depends on the situation. Here we had pretty good samples, so I didn't really do a lot of kick and snare processing like I usually do. However, if I did, my number one go-to plugin for drum processing is Knock. This one is fire. I will link it in the description. It's made by this producer, Decap, which is a world famous trap hip hop producer. And it's super unique because not a lot of plugins are made by producers or made by plugin companies. And so this dude went in here and he knew exactly what he was doing and exactly what he was looking for and implemented that in a 
drum processing plugin. Circling back to making everything common and giving everything a common dynamic and common features, this plugin is great for that. So we can shape the transients. So if we want to have a lot more punch in all of them, we can increase that right here. Or we can take away from it. And then we have three different levels of saturation here. So if we want to implement a little saturation, we can do that. And then we have this device. So what this basically does, this adds sub frequencies, but it's really good at pulling a sub out of a kick. So if you're not using a sub separate, especially in house music, if you want your sub to come from your kick, this unit right here, there's an Ableton Sock one, but this one is the best for doing that. So let's say our track's in F and we want to pull a sub bass out of this kick in F. So we can do that right there and add a little bit of sub to it. And then air so that those frequencies at the top make them a little bit more bright. And then this clipping unit is super fire. So we can kind of clip everything, do a little bit of softer, hard clipping. This will adjust how soft or hard it is. These are low pass and high pass. So if we only want to affect like the top end or the low end, we can gain match. So we're not tricking our ears into thinking it's better because it's louder. That's a thing. If it's something's coming out of your plugin louder, our ears are going to tell us that it's better. That's not always the case. So it's good to have a gain match tool. We can change the quality to high bipolar tone control so we can boost or cut the highs or lows. And then we can dry wet it at the end. So this is like the goat for drum processing. Typically this will end up on my drum group or my kick and my snare groups. We can match the punch, the saturation, the air, the clip. And then even if they're from different kits or they're slightly different drums, now they really all sound like they're coming from the same place or they're cut from the same cloth. So knock is fire. Pretty much always a little bit of glue compression just to like catch the peaks a little bit. Like this one's barely moving, but just on some of the heavier kicks, it's just barely nudging it down. And then we have some saturation like we just talked about. And then we have this rack right here, which I was doing here is automating some, some reverb. Those little subtle details. So notice right here, if we look at this, on our, on our uh, snare, so on our snare hit, we do a little bit of a reverb throw. And again, what that's doing is that's A, keeping stuff interesting and B, keeping stuff moving. So. When we have reverb swells, that's giving something size and direction. So putting our drums into a space, now our snare is, is growing in size and it's changing in direction. And then we have some parallel compression. So parallel compression, we've already talked about, but on drums, it's particularly useful. The reason for that is because we can, again, maintain our transients and have like a little bit of a denser signal. This is also called New York compression. And so we have like a super compressed signal, and then we're kind of blending that in with the dry signal, which is this one. This chain has nothing on it, so it's a dry signal. And then we have a little bit of pitch shifting over here, just like a little bit of a throw. And then this EQ is kind of just chilling. It's not really doing anything. I use these to reference where my drums are sitting. So I can see like, okay, our kick's sitting up here. We like that. Our snares are right above the line. We like that. Everything is sitting right where it should be. Group processing, gluing it together with, with compression, gluing it together with saturation, a little EQ if we need to. We really shouldn't have to EQ our drums too much if we pick the right samples and they're at the right volume level. So I've seen a lot of people, and I've done this myself, is like, say our snare is a little too loud, on their group or somewhere, they'll come in here and start cutting stuff out. And now we're like affecting this frequency on all of our drums, and we don't want to do that. So... This would be a situation where it's like, instead of doing that, let's just go and turn the snare down. So that's, that's what I did here. I turned the snare down by negative two. It was, it was coming in a little bit hot. And then we, we literally, in this situation, didn't have to do any EQing at all. Now, sometimes we'll get like harsh frequencies up here. We'll address a little bit or some mud from the kick, but we pick the right samples, light processing, volume levels are right. And like, literally that's 90% of having good sounding drums. And this is one of those things where the way you process your drums particularly 
will be particular to you. This is kind of what makes you a unique artist is like the, the, these little shuffles and these little reverb swells and the spatial imaging and all that, that is particular to you. So go in there and play around with it and just figure out what you like and what you don't like. Listen back to it, kind of be critical of everything you're hearing. And eventually you'll develop a technique that works for you based on these principles we've learned. Layering drums. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about layering drums. So this is another thing where just like processing, it's super easy to say, I, I need to do a lot of this and just way overdoing them and it doesn't need to be done. But when we're thinking about layering a drum, what we're asking ourselves is what frequency texture or characteristic is the drum missing? So I've seen a lot of people kind of just come in here and all willy nilly just start stacking drums. So they have like two snares and a clap over each other and a hat. And it's like, what purpose are all those drums serving? Because all you're really doing when you do stuff like that is you're creating a huge transient peak. None of the elements and the tones of each individual drum is really able to shine and you just kind of have a blob of sound. And now you have a huge problem because everything's summing up and you have this, this huge peak that you either have to compress to high heavens or clip or limit. So you don't always want to layer your drums. I'll kind of give you my thought process on when I'm layering your drums. So here's a snare. And let's say we're gonna put this snare on every quarter note or something like that. So first I would ask myself like, is this missing anything or is it sounding weak compared to like what I'm trying to do? And if, if we were doing like a house track, like yeah, I would probably wanna layer with like a kick. And so this type of, of layering is, is very prevalent in house music. Well, you get a lot of kick and snare overlap and layering and even like perk over layering. So our four on the floor beat in like house music is such a huge part of our beat overall that you will get stuff like this and just be critical and start listening to music you like and saying, hey, is that a clap? Is that a snare? Or is that a kick and a snare or a kick and a clap? And so that would be a situation where we're like, okay, now we want to layer different types of drums because we're, we're kind of making them work together. So you've probably heard something like this. And you might've missed that this actually has a kick underneath it. So it's not like this. It actually has the kicks with it as well. And then there's layering for variations. So maybe we'll have like one of these every other, every other snare. And this circles back to variation, not having the same thing over and over again. So what I like to do in my particular kind of drums, I, I like to make is I'll have a nice snare kind of driving the track every whatever it is on, on the three. And then I'll layer them, I'll like accent them with usually like a clap or like a perk or something, super quiet. So I'll turn these down by like negative 12 dB. And then I'll put a lot of reverb on them. And what that does is it just adds a little bit of change and a little bit of texture to, to particular hits. In the midst of an entire track, you probably wouldn't even pick up on this, but it's another one of those things where it's just not the same thing every time. And this is something that I see like over and over and over again in, in mentorship sessions. And literally we just heard this same drum four times in a row and like we're tired of it. As opposed to coming here and like, okay, we're gonna turn this down a little bit, adjust the, the gain. We're gonna accent these ones with another texture. And now that's interesting. So this, this would be a way that I would layer and that's to kind of accent stuff and draw a difference between each of these hits in just a subtle way. And then we would ask ourselves, is this missing a tone or like some body that we're, we're looking for? And sometimes it is. So like, this is a snare, so maybe we'll just put a clap right on top of this on every one. 
we might be missing tones that were like, dang, it doesn't really have these tones. It doesn't really have these frequencies or it doesn't have this transient material we're looking for. So circling back to talking about like the, the transient, the body and the tail, we're like, we like this snare. It works good with the track, but we need a little bit more body noomph. So maybe we'll layer a clap that has a lot more body to it. And again, layering, not always necessary. Some of these samples come layered. Sometimes the sample's good enough. It just needs to be turned down or processed a little bit. And so I challenge you guys to, when you're thinking about layering drums, close your eyes and imagine what is missing from this drum. Is it thin? Like if it's thin, how does it sound thin? Is it thin of frequencies or is it thin as far as like, maybe it's just a really sharp transient. Like maybe it's something like this and it's, it's just not taking up enough space on the timeline. So like close your eyes and try to diagnose like what's missing. Why don't I like this drum? What like what needs to be layered or, or does it need to be layered? So next kind of touching on EQing. So as far as EQing drums goes, some light EQing, any overlap. Most drums should already live in relatively their own range uh, and then removing unneeded frequencies. So again, we don't want to go in there and like dig into our drums super heavy. As we saw in like the, the trap example, on our percussive elements, we were like, okay, we know that we don't need the low end here. It's not contributing to this particular sound. Let's get it out of the way. And then sometimes we'll have competing frequencies, which we've already learned about in EQing. It's pretty much the same EQing rules. The main thing is we, we just wanna make sure nothing's talking over each other. So nothing's overlapping and fighting for space. And we wanna make sure that we don't over EQ. It's another one of those things where over EQing and taking out parts of the drum that is part of the reason why we chose that drum is super counterintuitive and it'll ruin our track. So like we pick this snare here. It's a super subtle snare, but we picked it because we like the sound of it. If we're coming in here and we're EQing all this out, we're taking away frequencies of why we chose the snare out of our sample library. So that's kind of a, a interesting way to think about it. So that's pretty much a as comprehensive as an overview of drums and drum processing as I can give. To kind of reiterate, start with good samples, make sure the volume levels are correct, go in there and, and make sure everything's grooving, there's some variation and there's some movement, and uh, then some group processing and, and some some individual processing if you have to. And, and just remember, don't overcomplicate it. Pick the right samples, use them in the right way, implement these techniques we learned and kind of keep an eye out for them, and you will have good sounding drums. So I hope this was helpful, I hope this was a little bit eye-opening, and I will see you guys in the next module.